It's coming up to nearly six months since Puerto Rico was battered by Hurricane Maria, yet nearly half a million Americans there are still without power and reported suicides have jumped more than 50 percent. Has President Donald Trump abandoned the island? I'll ask one of his biggest critics, Mayor of San Juan, Carmen Yulín Cruz. Also on the show, Jacob Zuma was forced to stand down as president of South Africa last month. I'll talk to his nemesis, the anti-corruption czar Tuli Madoncella, about his fall from power and the future of the ANC. Mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Uh, it's been five months since Hurricane Maria devastated the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico, where you're the mayor of the capital city, San Juan. Right now, what, in your view, is the single biggest challenge for people living on that island? How bad is the situation there still? Uh, first of all, Maddie, thank you very much for the opportunity to continue to update uh, the viewers in the United States and around the world. Um, right now, the aftermath of Maria has, um, if, if I had to summarize it, has contributed to a, a social meltdown. Um, suicide rates have gone up. Um, crime uh, is at the same level that it was before Maria, which is, was at a high level. Still about 30% of the population does not have any electricity. Uh, we have towns in the inner side of the island that have no electricity whatsoever. And, and the reconstruction and transformation of Puerto Rico does not seem to get off the ground. Uh, we have been granted $4.9 billion in a loan by the government of the United States. We haven't gotten one single cent of that loan. Uh, so we are looking at, uh, in the next months, a, a, a deepening of a social crisis that was there before Maria, but, but that definitely uh, was widened uh, and much more aggressive after Maria. You said, uh, you, you said at the start, thank you for the opportunity to update the world and US viewers. Do you feel in Puerto Rico that you've been abandoned by the world, abandoned by the US? Because you're not a US state, but you are an unincorporated US territory. The 3.5 million people who live there are US citizens. Uh, do you feel abandoned by the US government? How would you judge the current US government response to this social meltdown in Puerto Rico? The U.S. government response has been inadequate, has been inefficient, uh, and has been inappropriate. And there has been uh, some people in the Trump administration that have been, I would say, honest enough that they have admitted to that. But the American people have been very upfront, have been very open-hearted in the world. So we have to make a very big differentiation between the Trump administration, which will now say that they're dumping millions of dollars in Puerto Rico. And, and what we want to make sure the American people know is that we haven't received uh, that money. That uh, transformation has not taken place. So U.S. government agencies and institutions were widely criticized uh, for their handling of Puerto Rico's crisis. A UN rights expert even said, quote, we can't fail to note the dissimilar urgency and priority given to the emergency response in Puerto Rico compared to the US states affected by hurricanes in recent months. Do you believe Puerto Rico was treated differently, unfairly, and if so, why? Uh, m most definitely. Uh, and it's not only my belief, but it's a widespread belief of the people of Puerto Rico. Um, I think probably it had to do a little bit of because of ignorance. It was also an issue of putting standard operating procedures into a different circumstance and not being able to adapt and overcome. That, that was one thing. Uh, two, when that happened, there was a, a stubborn streak in the Trump administration, led by President Trump himself, that everything was okay, that this was a good news story. And they continued to do everything they could in order to ensure that this was a good news story. There were even some emails uh, written by the Pentagon stating that we continue to have a lot of difficulty making sure that this story is perceived as a good news story. And they even named me 
as one of the reasons why they weren't able to produce them. Just sticking with the actual relief effort, do you think Texas, Louisiana, Florida got more help from the U.S. government, from the federal government, more attention from the U.S. media and the wider U.S. public than the people of Puerto Rico uh, because Puerto Ricans are Latin, they're in the Caribbean, they're residents of a former colony. Do you think prejudice played a role? Racism even? Well, we are a colony of the United States. When uh, all the decisions that are important to you are made by the Congress of the United States, uh, I, I wish I didn't have to say this because it is very strong, but we are a colony of the United States. I'm wondering about motivations. Are you saying when President Trump and his colleagues look at Puerto Rico, are they looking at Puerto Ricans as a different type of people to the people who live in Florida, Texas, Louisiana? That's what I'm wondering is your view. Uh, mo mo most definitely. Uh, and the botched effort and the, their continued um, strategy of saying we're doing a great job. It, it's there. Look, right now, uh, and I'll use the municipality of San Juan, we uh, used $21 million of the municipality of San Juan in order to ensure that we were prepared for both hurricanes Irma and Maria. We still have not gotten $11.2 million reimbursement back from FEMA. This is the largest municipality in Puerto Rico. This is repeating itself throughout the entire island nation of Puerto Rico. And what that does is that it hinders the municipality and the city's ability to provide essential services uh, like medicine, providing medicine to people. So just to be clear then and to clarify, you're saying that the U.S. government's uh, botched response, what you call botched response to Hurricane Maria and the situation in Puerto Rico was affected by racism on the part of the Trump administration towards Puerto Rico? Um, it could be affected by racism. It could be affected by ignorance. It could be affected by the inability to adapt standard operating procedures because there was no sense of urgency. And there still seems to be no sense of urgency. If you approve a $4.9 billion uh, uh, loan in November and you still haven't given one cent for the recovery, there's no sense of urgency there. After you publicly criticized the U.S. government's relief efforts, uh, President Donald Trump attacked you on Twitter uh, and suggested you were a politically motivated ingrate with poor leadership. Uh, you responded by calling him unfit to lead. Why do you think he came after you personally like that? Were you surprised to see those tweets? No, you know, that, that's the way the president uh, deals with people that tell the truth. Um, and this is not about me. This is not about the president of the United States. We happen to have the cameras in front of us. So we had an opportunity and he had an opportunity to lead. He had an opportunity to say, look, we haven't done what is right. We haven't done enough. Um, but then he decided to grade himself and give himself a 10 out of a 10. I've said this and I will continue to say it. If you are a leader and you grade yourself in a humanitarian crisis and you are utterly satisfied, well, five months into it, 30% of the Puerto Rican population still does not have electricity. And I mean, you need to regrade yourself. Clearly, President Trump has issues with honesty and ego, but you produced some pretty inflammatory language in the aftermath of that hurricane. You suggested that the federal government's failure to provide food, water and the rest could amount to, quote, genocide. Uh, looking back now, that was an absurd thing to say, was it not? No, it was not. If you're a Puerto Rican... You think, that, you you think the Trump administration food, was deliberately trying to kill water, the people of Puerto Rico? And you don't... That's what a genocide is, the deliberate killing of a I people. think that what they did... I. I well, believe me, I know what a genocide is. And to quote myself properly what I said, that it would amount to almost something similar to genocide. And I would still say that. 500,000 people have left Puerto Rico. 30% of our population, we don't want electricity to have air conditioning. We want electricity to be able to operate in hospitals without having to use the lights in our cell phones. We want electricity to be able to have our children go to school on a normal day and not on a part-time basis as we're doing right now. We want electricity to be able to jumpstart our economy, to depend less on what we are given and to do more onto ourselves. Even before the hurricane hit, uh, Puerto Rico was in the midst of a major financial crisis. Nearly half the population lived under the poverty line. The unemployment Correct. rate was tripled out of the U.S. The island was $73 billion in debt. It declared bankruptcy last summer. 
Before becoming mayor of San Juan, you yourself served in Puerto Rico's House of Representatives for four years. How much responsibility mm -hmm. should the island's political class, yourself included, take for the dire economic situation in Puerto Rico, even before the hurricane hit? Oh, we need to own up to our own mistakes. And I've said that over and over. That's why I say we need to just use this opportunity to transform the way that we look at things, to transform the way that we do things, uh, to depend less in what is sent in the matter of help from outside and to do more for unto ourselves. This is why I continue to ask anyone that would listen. Um, we need to be able to build, for example, solar panels in Puerto Rico. So anyone out there listening, come to San Juan. We will make it worth your while. Uh, but we also need to ensure that the monies that are coming are not monies used only to hire companies from the U.S. that come to Puerto Rico, but to hire locally so that the money stays in locally and that we can revamp our economy. We need to be able to plug in into the world economy. You've been a very outspoken critic of uh, the governor and the Puerto Rican government's plans to privatize um, power companies and infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. in the wake of the hurricane. Um, but what's your alternative to privatization? It's all very well saying we, let's not privatize. But given the dire economic situation Puerto Rico is in, what would you be doing instead if you were governor? I'm not the governor. I'm the mayor of uh, the city of San Juan. But you don't have to be the governor to be able to have an opinion, right? So there's two areas. Uh, that have to do with electricity, the generation and the transmission. The transmission areas is now being rebuilt completely, and it's been updated, but it's been updated to fossil fuel. So we need to continue to have very specific targets and goals to transform and generate a lot more of our energy from solar energy, from the wind, and from the ocean. Uh, desalinization plants in order to get our water. Okay, one final question, Mayor Cruz. Do you have plans to run for Puerto Rico's governorship yourself in 2020 to make some of this stuff that you're talking about happen? Some of your critics say that's why you've been so outspoken in recent months, to boost your political profile. I have said that this is not the time for political calculations. This is a time for so you're not ruling it out. We have a real issue in Puerto Rico with crime, and we have to have some very difficult conversations about the future of the status of Puerto Rico, but about how we transform and how do we make sure that we move forward from this humanitarian and economic crisis. Carmen Yulín Cruz, thank you very much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you for the opportunity. Despite being illegal across the world, what's been called modern slavery is more widespread than ever before. But why? In this week's Reality Check, Upfront producer Kieran Alvey investigates. When disturbing reports out of Libya in 2017 exposed horrible images of a modern-day slave trade with captured migrants and refugees being auctioned off for labor, people around the world were stunned. But the reality is, this exists beyond Libya. From the UK and the Gulf countries to India and China, today there are actually over 40 million modern-day slaves, victims of forced labor, human trafficking, and debt bondage. And we're more complicit than you might think. Across Italian farmlands where sun-kissed tomatoes are harvested each season, thousands of migrant farm workers from across Europe, Africa, and as far away as India are working in conditions of absolute exploitation. With wages withheld and workers' documents confiscated to keep them from fleeing, migrants are often forced to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week without breaks, and even subject to repeated rape and sexual assault. These conditions help Italy remain one of the world's largest tomato producers. In Brazil, slave labor is rampant in cattle farms. With ranch hands working under the threat of being killed, wages are regularly withheld as debts to the employer, sometimes for years, and workers are often forbidden from leaving the ranches where they're treated like animals, even sometimes sleeping in the same corral as the cattle. For many, slavery has become the grim trademark of Brazilian beef, which includes China and the EU as clients in its multi-billion dollar export industry. 
And take Thailand. The world's third largest seafood exporter is also one of the world's most notoriously dangerous work environments. Reports have found men and women from Cambodia and Myanmar being tricked, kidnapped, or sold into fishing operations, enduring forced starvation, sleep deprivation, and even being chained, beheaded, or thrown overboard for making mistakes. We're talking about a $7 billion global export industry, over 200 million of which is just for pet food in the U.S. Yes, modern slavery should stun the world, but it needs to go beyond that. If we as consumers and companies don't pay attention to supply chains behind the things we buy, the world's most vulnerable will continue to be exploited for cheaper goods. Because to many, it's not personal, it's just business. After facing countless corruption scandals and surviving eight attempts to unseat him, South Africa's controversial President Jacob Zuma resigned from office last month. His deputy Cyril Ramaphosa has since taken over the presidency on an interim basis and pledged to clean up South African politics. So does Zuma's departure really mark the start of a new political era for the country? Or is corruption too entrenched in the ruling African National Congress Party. Joining me to discuss this is Tuli Maroncella, South Africa's so-called anti-corruption czar, who was the country's public protector for seven years and is also a former member of the ANC. She's been credited with exposing Zuma's abuse of public funds, and she joins me now from Cape Town. Uh, Tuli Maroncella, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Given you investigated former President Jacob Zuma when you were public protector of South Africa up until 2016, and given you wrote two incriminating reports about him, how much credit should South Africans give to you for hastening his departure from office last month? Well, first, thank you for the privilege. I don't expect any credit because I was paid to do my job, and I did that job the best way I could, and I was working with a team. Every member of that team should get some of the credit. South Africans, too, should get the credit because if it wasn't for the people enforcing some of the decisions I made, those decisions would not have been made. And the judiciary and the media also played their roles in making sure that the truth came out. South Africa's National Prosecuting Authority has plans to announce in the coming weeks whether they're going to pursue uh, the 18 charges for over 700 counts of corruption, uh, money laundering, fraud and racketeering against uh, Zuma that date back to an illicit arms deal uh, from over a decade ago. It's a case that's been dismissed and reinstated in the courts in the past. Do you think those charges against him still need to be pursued now he's out of office? Well, the yes, charges have to be pursued whether a person is or is out of office. And you must recall that those charges had nothing to do with President Zuma being in office. They relate to the arms deal period. But having said that, I think the most important uh, issues that the president would have to answer to would be the issues relating to state capture and what is seen as uh, an act of surrendering his power to one member of his family and the Gupta family to run the affairs of this government. It's in the interest of the nation that he's answerable for any wrongdoing he is alleged to have committed. And if he indeed if he is guilty of that wrongdoing, he should face the same consequences as other people do. How is it that such a dark cloud of controversy spanning over a decade never prevented Zuma from advancing to the highest office in the land to lead the party of Nelson Mandela with considerable ANC support for years? Yes, it does say that the ANC or the African National Congress, which is the governing party in South Africa, needs to look back and say, what is it that allowed President Zoma to rise to the presidency, given the fact that he had no commitment to ethics? And that also is, applies to the current members of the highest decision-making bodies of the ANC. The ANC has to ask itself, should these people end up becoming president, do they have the right values, which is the highest level of professional ethics as required by Section 195 of our Constitution? 
But didn't Mandela himself, Nelson Mandela, who you were understandably a great admirer of, many of us were, didn't he lay the groundwork in, in a way for all of the political dysfunction and corruption that we're seeing in South Africa today? He laid the groundwork for presidents, for controversial successors like Thabo Mbeki and Jacob Zuma. Is it time to maybe also reassess the Mandela political legacy in South Africa? Well, you could, but I wouldn't really necessarily say it's Mandela's fault. He himself said that even the most benevolent of governments have within them persons with propensities for human failings. Nobody could have foreseen what happened. But you're right, though, that there has to be some introspection and looking at what is it within the governing party and within our own national ethical framework that allowed what happened to happen. But Mandela did praise Zuma's leadership just over a decade ago uh, when some of these allegations were already being made against him. He called him inclusive. He called him a unifier. He urged the ANC to rally behind him. When I first met, met President Zuma, he was inclusive. He was a unifier. And of course, you take people at face value, nobody prepared South Africa for the divisive presidency of President Zuma and the, the use of uh, uh, racial divides, the, the abuse of social injustice as a diversion to investigations uh, on corruption. I don't think President Mandela could have predicted that. Okay. I certainly didn't predict it. Well, let's look at some of your predictions or recent statements. Uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, Zuma's former deputy president, who's now the interim president of South Africa until elections are held next year, you expressed support for him online last month, thanking him for putting your, quote, beautiful country on the pedestal of hope again. But he's already facing harsh criticism for a point Pointing a lot of scandal-ridden, controversial ANC figures to key positions. For example, David Mabuza, uh, the scandal-ridden deputy head of the ANC, is now his deputy president. Uh, he reappointed a minister of home affairs who's found to have lied under oath. So are you giving Ramaphosa a pass, given he doesn't seem to be as worried about appointing officials who are accused of wrongdoing and corruption, as maybe he should be? I have given him a pass and I still give him a pass. He certainly has placed us on the pedestal of hope. But I have been speaking about this for a month now and even in my column on, on, on the City Press and Report, I indicated that he's not a saint and that whether he gravitates to the dark side or to the light side will depend on whether or not people stand up. If the people do not behave in such a way that the governing party ha uh, fears them, then you will find that President Ramaphosa fears the dark side of the ANC and then he gets drawn to that corner. Tuli, you were part of the team led by Nelson Mandela that drafted the final post-apartheid constitution of South Africa in 1996. How worried are you that the ANC's recent time in office, plagued with corruption scandals, cronyism, mishandling of crises, will end up tainting the legacy of not just the ANC and the way in which it created this new state, but the memory of the party's entire anti-apartheid struggle? I am concerned about the ANC losing its direction and until a few days ago the, there was an indication that it had lost its direction and there was a possibility that it would lose its direction together with the country. But I'm very hopeful right now that under Ramaphosa we do have a balance of forces within the governing party. We have those who would like to continue covering up for the plundering and looting of state resources and those who really want this country to be governed with integrity, uh, with an eye to social justice, so that it what? doesn't only live to its potential, but it also reclaims its position as a model democracy in the world. What about the argument that it's time another party governed South Africa, that the ANC has been in power too long? It keeps winning elections since 1994, since apartheid ended. It's the only party that's governed South Africa. Maybe that's part of the problem. Well, if there was another party to govern, maybe it would be their time. What people are right about is that monopoly, whether it's in business or politics, uh, perpetuates corruption. If you don't fear losing power, then you have no reason 
to do your best. And that's what was happening eventually. But by last year, the ANC as the governing party realized that it could not just um, uh, uh, continue to allow lapses in terms of uh, ethics and, 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 and the deepening of corruption. One final question. You've been encouraged to run for office in the past yourself. Uh, do you have no political ambitions at all? You're not tempted to run for office yourself to try and fix, clean up South African politics from the inside? Certainly, I don't have any political ambitions, but I do have ambitions to clean up the system. That's why I've gone back to civil society as the chair of social justice at Stellenbosch University to make sure that we deal with laws and policies around social justice. I've also been part of starting a foundation which is called the Tuma Foundation. The, the foundation is seeking to build democracy literacy within civil society and to activate civil society to be their own liberators. Tuli Madonsela, thanks for joining me on Upfront. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.